What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. For the rest of the video, I'm not going to call it by its entire name. I'm just going to call it the Pocket 6K uh, because the name is ridiculously long. So we'll just go with Pocket 6K. Now, I did want to clarify that this is become my B cam. My A cam that I'm filming on now is the Ursa Mini Pro G2. But I have used this camera, the Pocket 6K, almost exclusively for about since I bought it in September. So right around, what is that? 10 months, nine months ish. Um, so I've used it exclusively for YouTube, for TV commercials and all that kind of good stuff. So I have a good bit of experience. Now I'm not gonna review the camera necessarily because plenty of people have already done that. I'll put some links in the description for some great overall in-depth reviews, but I'll talk about kind of what it has to offer, what my experience is using it, what its downfalls are, what the plus sides are. And I've got all this extra stuff over here that I'm gonna show you how you can kind of rig it out if you need to. And uh, if you don't need to, how you can kind of run and gun with it because you definitely can do that. So let's start off with pricing. Now, when I bought the Pocket 6K, it was about $2,500. I bought it off Adorama in September. Now on B&H, it's actually under $2,000. So you can get this for $1995, uh, which is fantastic and an incredible value. And the Pocket 4K dropped even lower. I think you can get it close to $1,200, maybe less. So really great value if you need a couple cams um, for a dual cam setup or something like that. Uh, again, this is the Pocket 6K, so it has the EF mount by default. So all of my Canon glass fits beautifully on it. My Sigma 18 to 35, which I'm filming on now. I've got a 24 to 105. I've got a, what's the other one? I have a 10 to 18 for real estate as well. But all that being said, uh, EF mount here, um, which is great. So who needs 6K? Well, nobody really. But what it does do is it gives you incredibly crisp 4K if you want to downscale to that. Or what I do, which is I downscale to 5K. So YouTube does not have a 6K preset. They go from I think 4K, 5K to 8K. And I'm not going to upscale it to 8K. I guess I could and get a better bit rate, but I'm not going to do that. So I just downscale it a tiny bit to 5K and it is incredibly, incredibly crispy. So uh, that's kind of how I do it. And I don't, again, most people are still getting into the 4K world. Very few are even touching the 8K world right now. So is 6K necessary? No, but it's the same reason why I shot in 4K five years ago, because now all my stuff I shot then in 4K still looks good. So it's a little bit of future proofing, a little bit of just being obsessed with technology and always wanting to increase my quality, which is what I'm all about. So again, Pocket 6K here, um, EF mount. So you've got a couple of different mounting points up on top and one down on the bottom. And we'll take a look at what I do with those in a second. You've got your on off switch, your function buttons, record button, you've got a stills button, ISO, shutter speed, white balance button there. Now over on the side, you've got a microphone input, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. You've got a full size HDMI, which is fantastic. You've got the little two pin connector there, USB-C port, which is awesome because you can use that to record straight to SSDs. And you've got a mini XLR port right there. So you can connect XLR audio if you want to. So I took the little covers off because I keep it in a nice foam padded case. So I don't, nothing really gets in here. And it's just so much of a hassle to pop those things in and out every time. I, I don't like it. Now on the back, you've got a five inch LCD touchscreen, beautiful color representation, super easy menu system, by far the easiest menu system on any camera out there, uh, especially with the capabilities that this has. So you can change all of your codecs in here. 
switch between the B raw and the pro res. We'll talk about that in a second. All your different resolutions. You can change what shows up on your monitor. You can add display LUTs, which I do regularly. Adjust your audio settings. You can actually have two different audio inputs at the same time, which is crazy. Uh, you can change your time, date, um, you know, focus assist and what you want that to see. You can put your presets in here. So this is super handy. So I have a 6K 24, 6K 30, 6K 50, and then I have a 4K 30 uh, and a 4K 60 as well, if I wanna kind of switch between those really quickly. And then you have your LUTs section. So you have a couple different LUTs in here by default. You've got the Pocket 6K film to extended video, Pocket 6K to Rec 2020 hybrid log gamma, 6K film to Rec 2020 PQ gamma, and then Pocket 6k film to video i don't really use any of those to be honest with you i have my own luts that i use uh, i use the leaming lut pro uh, for the i think it's the v4 um, film 1.5 so i'll leave a link to that in the description check it out it's a fantastic lut and i also have the boz b md film to rec 709 and i use that all the time it is basically as quick as you can get from B-RAW to usable footage. Just It's just a one-click thing. It looks incredible. So I'll definitely put a link to that as well. So if you're working on a client project and they don't even want to touch that B-RAW footage and you don't want to either, you can go ahead and just bake one of these LUTs straight in and it looks so good out of camera. So I'll definitely leave links in the description to both of those because I use them every single time. So how I got those on there is I just put an SD card in and then it actually lets you import LUTs straight into camera to save on the camera to use anytime you want. It is. It's perfect. I had the same thing on my GH5. I used it all the time. So this is just uh, another super easy way to use this camera. So in addition, you have a few more buttons on the back. You've got a focus button. You've got a high frame rate button. You've got a zoom in button. You've got the menu button. Then you've got your play button for when you want to actually review the footage that you took. And again, all these different settings can be accessed through the touchscreen and through the UI, which is again, the easiest UI you'll ever use on a camera. On the front, you have a single record button right here that I never use. And then you've got this little uh, swivel wheel where you can change, um, you know, go into your frame rate and change that, go into your shutter speed, change that uh, with this little dial. Other than that, you have some built-in mics on either side here that are good for scratch audio. I would never use them production-wise, but scratch audio is fine. You have a strap loop on the other side. I don't know why you'd use a camera strap with this, but you have that. And then uh, again, the fans underneath. So this thing does get a little warm, uh, but I mean, you're recording 6K raw, so. So that's pretty much everything on the body. Now let's take a look at the storage options. You have a CFast 2.0 card slot, one of them, and then an SD card slot. I don't use either of those for anything. Um, I only record straight to SSDs and then I just pop them off plug them straight into my computer and edit right off of them. It is the most beautifully glorious and simple workflow. So I love that. Let's talk about codecs. So inside, as I mentioned briefly earlier, you've got B-RAW and you've got ProRes. I basically exclusively record in B-RAW because I am not an Apple user. So ProRes can be used on Windows, but it, it's not it doesn't play as well with Windows. Uh, so I mostly use B-RAW. Uh, you have constant bitrate and constant quality, and then you have your different compression ratios, three to one, five to one, eight to one, and 12 to one. And then under that, you've got all of your different resolutions. I usually stick at about five to one compression. I think that's probably the best bang for your buck. Uh, on a one terabyte SSD, I get about 140 minutes, maybe 180 minutes around there, uh, depending on what my frame rate is. And then, Anything lower than that is fine. Um, there's really nothing. You can go 12 to one and be perfectly fine. But I just, I like that added extra quality. And I never really go up to three to one. It's just too big of a file size. And I don't really, I think you have diminishing returns at that point, unless you're working on maybe indie films or something like that, then maybe bump it up to three to one to get the best possible quality. And that's under constant bitrate. I don't use constant quality. Um, there's trade-offs for sure, but uh, I like to stick with constant bitrate. So, Again, I never really touch ProRes, but if you do switch over to ProRes, that's gonna drop your resolution down to 4K. Uh, you've got 4K DCI, which is gonna give you a little bit of extra width. And then you've got Ultra HD, which is just 3840 by 2160, and then you've got HD. So again, you're shooting in B-RAW, so that comes with some trade-offs because not only do you have a huge file size, but you're also working with raw footage. So when you import that in, it didn't initially work when I first bought it in September natively with Premiere. Now there is a Premiere plugin by default from Blackmagic that you can use. There was another plugin that was a paid one, but this one is actually free from Blackmagic, which is awesome. And it's gotten better. It was a little rusty at first, but it's definitely very stable now with my experience. So it's really simple to use. You just 
drop that raw footage in there. Premiere plays it back almost seamlessly, especially with the most recent update of Premiere, which added hardware encoding with NVENC, so you can use your PC's graphics card to just absolutely chew through it. The timeline plays back basically in real time, and I can export. I'm exporting 14 gigabyte, 6K, 5K videos in 10 minutes, eight minutes-ish. It's unbelievable what you can actually do and the quality that you can get out of this with RAW. So I pretty much just drop it in Premiere, drop Lumetri on it, hit it with one of those LUTs, maybe adjust the, the white balance and the uh, ISO and stuff in the RAW settings. And that's pretty much it. I don't do much else than that, but you could really push it if you wanted to. You have that flexibility and that uh, dynamic range to mess with and that those all that detail in the colors to really, really mess around with if you wanted to. You also get a copy of Resolve that comes free with your purchase of the camera, which is awesome. And I have used it to color grade some uh, kind of more client-based stuff, and it works incredibly well too. So really, you have a lot of flexibility. So let's talk about the downsides, because that's what everyone wants to know. What is the number one downside? And it is very easy, this. This is the LPE6 Canon battery, and it lasts me 20 minutes, 25 minutes, recording at 6K, 30 frames a second, unusable. I have four or five of them. I mean, that's terrible. And it's just gonna die on you anyway, and, and most of the time it dies on you before the battery even runs out, according to the screen. So nev I never trust it, I never use it like that. I think the only time that I've ever used it like that is when I popped it on a gimbal, which you can really balance this pretty easily on most modern gimbals. I have the Ronin S and it balances fine um, with a wider, lighter lens. If you have something a little heavier, you may need counterweights, but that's the only time I would ever use the built-in battery and I never do gimbal shots for very long, so that's never really an issue for me. So I've rigged it up and that is something that you can do and I would recommend doing especially for longer applications. So let me show you what I've done to rig this thing out. Now I have two setups, a more compact handheld one and then a full production rig. Let's take a look. So if you guys do not have one of these little small rig multi-tools, get one. They're dirt cheap. I think they're about 20 bucks. I'll have a link down in the description. I'll have a link down in the description for everything I talk about here, but get your hands on one of these. It is an absolute lifesaver. I carry it with me in all of my different camera setups because it's got everything you could possibly need. Not sponsored by the way, obviously, but do it. So the cage that I went with is the small rig cage. I know Tilta has a really nice cage as well, but uh, small rigs are a little bit cheaper and the camera is expensive enough as it is. So I was trying to get the cheapest possible rig to get set up. So I went with the full cage. There was also a half cage, but I, I like to have all the possible mounting points. So I went with the full. Additionally, I put on the small rig SSD mount. Uh, this I think is the version two mount. Uh, I'm not positive, and I put a cold shoe mount on this side as well. So let's go ahead and get this on the camera. So small rig actually gives you a little Allen key that magnets underneath the cage, which is actually awesome if you do forget something like this, but I always have this with me, so I don't need it. It attaches with this really secure bracket at the bottom that has two little kind of holding pins and then the single, uh, screw there and then there's also one on top so you get that super secure i mean this cage is rock solid which is why i like it so much additionally this small rig mount is very secure as well it's got two um what size is that it just says three so whatever the third wrench is on here it's the smallest one um secures on there with that now the only thing i don't like about the ssd mount is that these two little um kind of tightening screws kind of bump into each other, which is kind of annoying sometimes, but it is what it is, it's not that big a deal. So again, that cold shoe on the side. So this is the starting point here. Next, I take this wooden top handle that actually uh, attaches via this NATO rail here. It's super simple, no, it's basically toolless, which is why I like it so much. So I always keep the cage on, I rarely ever take it off. So I just slide this onto the NATO, tighten it down here, and then I've got this monitor mount up top that I just, again, it's toolless, so I just screw it in to this little clamp here. It secures, you tighten it. This is small rig also, by the way, this wooden top handle. So that gives me my monitor mount. As far as monitors go, I've had many different ones, 
but I prefer a seven inch monitor. That may not be everyone's preference, but I think that I'm usually shooting car videos, so I'm pretty far away from the monitor, so I need something nice and big. Honestly, I'd use a 28 inch monitor <laughs> plugged in standing on a, a TV stand if I had to, or if I could, I should say. Um, but anyway, I went with the seven inch. I wanna get my hands on an Atomos, but they are expensive. So I went with the Best View seven inch 4K field monitor. This thing is incredibly sharp, incredibly bright. That's the best part because I film outside most of the time. So I needed a super bright monitor. And I actually found this video off of Parker Walbex. He did a an excellent monitor walkthrough, budget monitors, seven inch, five inch, all that kind of good stuff. And he highly recommended this one. So I checked it out and it is fantastic. So the best view monitor here, and it uses those same Sony batteries that I mentioned, which I have a ton of. So boom, there is that battery. And yes, it is the F970. Clipped that in. And then I like to use a side handle. So I will use this wooden side handle. I don't think this is small rig. I'll have it in the description, whatever the brand is. It's, it's whatever cheapest one I could find on Amazon. And obviously I would have the monitor flipped around here for what I'm doing, uh, kind of handheld stuff. So I'd have that on there. And then again, SSDs, I use the Samsung T5 portable SSDs as most people do. Screws right in there. Got this super short USB cable. I'll have a link to that in the description. Plug that in. It flexes really nicely. I can just bring that down plug it right into the USB port here. Boom, stays kind of out of the way. It's very, very low profile, very, very slim. I'm actually using it right now, so I can't show you, but for audio, I use the Rode Wireless Go Mini Lav Pack. So it's a little wireless lav, sits right here on this cold shoe. I run it over into the headphone jack, and then I have the other end clipped to my shirt and in my pocket. It is, I mean, it's barely the size, it's a little bigger than the size of a quarter. It fits, it's super light. You can have it on a gimbal, you can do anything like that. So that's normally what goes here. And then I will use a little coiled HDMI cable up top into the side. And that is pretty much it. And then of course I'd have my 18 to 35 on there. Let me grab a different lens. So I've got my 24 to 105, this is a little bit of a longer lens. But put that on there. And boom, that is my light setup. I know it looks beefy, especially because of how tall the monitor is. And in fact, to make it even better, I actually bought the other side wooden handle. So this is the right side handle and I will sometimes screw this right on here. Boom, now you've got an even more secure double handle setup to where you can really get some nice smooth handheld footage, especially if you have a stabilized lens because Unfortunately, the body does not have stabilization, which is fine because it's a cinema camera. By definition, cinema cameras most of the time do not have in-body image stabilization because you get that kind of wobbling jello effect um, sometimes with stabilization. So I've got an optically stabilized lens here with the 24 to 105 double handle setup, nice monitor. Again, I could get one of those batteries that has the USB port so I could run a D-tap into the power and then I'd have a longer battery life than using these LPE6 batteries. But for the most part, I don't shoot like this. I very rarely do handheld with this because it just it's just too shaky, unfortunately. So what I usually do is I won't put this side handle on and I won't put this side handle on, but I leave everything else the same. I attach this. This is just a, I think, Manfrotto plate basically. And then I have this shoulder rig, basically. Um, I don't even know what brand it is. It's just off Amazon, but I'll try and find it and put it in the description. So I just slide this on, snaps right into place, lock that down. And then I use V-mount batteries because why not? And I have this small rig cheese plate with a V-mount uh, locking. This is not the powered one. This is just this standard holding locking one. So pop that down. I can't find the actual cable that I normally use, but I have a little locking pin connector for power. And then I run the other side. This is obviously uh, like a DC, it's not a D-tab, but I'll just plug it straight into there and run the camera power 
off of the V-mount battery. What I could also do is do a dummy battery for the Sony battery, do a splitter off the V-mount and then power both things, but I tend to just wanna power the camera because I don't mind having the battery on the back here and it eliminates some cables that uh, the Ursa unfortunately does not. It has a lot of cables running off of it. So this is basically the setup I use every single day for filming videos, um, at least for filming B-roll or uh, B-cam type stuff. And it's awesome because this mounts directly onto my tripod and so I can just pop this on, take the Ursa off, put it on a different tripod. They all have the same uh, quick release plate at the bottom. So it's super, super convenient, super, super handy. And the image you get out of it, you just can't beat it for the price point. You just can't. So that is my rig here, how I've set it up to make it as practical as I can. And again, if I've got it on the tripod like this and I say, oh, I wanna get a real quick, you know, interior shot of a car and I don't wanna shove this in the interior. I just pop this right off, take this off. The battery charges while it's on the V-mount and then I just kinda, you know, do this whole number, get the shot and we're done. So that is basically everything uh, on the Blackmagic. Now, as far as usability goes, it is by far one of the easiest cameras to use <laughs> that I have ever been around. Again, that user interface is incredible. The button layout's great. I think the ergonomics are fine. It's definitely not the most uh, conveniently shaped camera, but I think for what you can do, uh, it, it's pretty, pretty incredible. So I'm a huge fan. I've never really had any problems. I had one SSD, um, not die completely, but it kind of pooped out on me and I had to do a recovery to, and it was during a wedding too, which was not good. I had to do a recovery to get all my footage back. But other than that, that one time, that was very early on, I have never had a single problem with this thing. It is absolutely incredible to use. I would highly recommend it. If you're looking to get the best possible image for the lowest possible price, this is your camera. All right, guys, and that is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Drop a like on the video if you loved it. Tell me in the comments down below. Do you have one? Are you gonna get your hands on one? What do you think of the test footage? Do you have any questions? Let's have a conversation about it down in the comments. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn your bell notifications on to be among the first to see every new video the second they get published. We'll see you in the next one.